cool. Wow. Do I always forget? Yeah, but I mean, dude, beautiful, beautiful art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's like I've been a uh, like characters. Garrett gave me that uh the artist way book. Yeah, that's a great. Book. I haven't started on that because. I don't know, the book makes it sound very foreboding and like makes it sound like this big like step in your life, which I'm sure that it is, but like <laughs> it's putting that much stress on reading a book or like doing like the daily things makes you want to do it less, which we were just learning about in psychology, which is so cool. Um, I like that book, The Artist Way, but you're definitely right, man. Um, German. The red book is written in German. Red book is written in German. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Next is in German, but it includes quotations from the Vulgate in Latin, a few mm -hmm. inscriptions, names written in Latin and Greek, and a brief marginal quotation from the Bhagavad Gita in English. Because don't a lot of like, or I know this is like might reign true for philosophy is in like Germans, like the language that you're like meant to do all this stuff in. I think it it all depends on like historical lineage and what culture mm. um, it comes from. But that's what I really like about Jung. Mm. He was so cross-cultural in his study and mm. transpersonal psychology. So he looked at um, Germanic languages. Mm. Um, well, yeah, no, because um, I've been getting into uh, like, oops, yesterday me and um, Sean were... Uh, getting into some Gnostic stuff. Yeah. Uh, and we were reading about like the Gnostic uh, Easter, just because, you know, Easter's coming up and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So it was just really cool to see the like correlations between all of these like different religions. Because like thinking about it, like logically, the sky is the one thing that we had in common throughout like millennia. And so it makes a lot of sense that everybody's religion like comes from those stars and like because of that that's what connects us all and like then there that goes to further idea of like us having like the the uh what's it called the our meridians and our energies and having yeah, like yeah. our like energies go outside of ourselves to being able to affect other people it's just it's, i've been getting into it all and it's been very it's very cool dude it's it's awesome all the and there's so much but you're mm -hmm. right about the interlocking web Mm -hmm. uh, like ancient Chinese meridians, mm -hmm. Indian Ayurvedic sciences, mm -hmm. the Gnostics were really unique mm -hmm. in what they brought. Mm -hmm. Greek philosophy, yeah. So, yeah, no, and it's just yeah, no. I've been, I'm enjoying the Gnostic kind of perspective of it all because it's uh, uh, something like getting into like et etymology and stuff is yeah. like, it's English is like a deeply occulted language, uh, and it's like it's not about the words themselves. It's about the vibrations and like the sounds that you make. Cause like with like an oar on like a boat, I, mean, I was, uh, uh, there's this podcast and they were breaking down row, row, row your boat uh, gently down the street. Wow. Um, so it's like the idea of like rowing your boat is like, uh, is the same thing as like moving through life. And like, so that's why it says going gently down the stream. And it's like, you need that oar, which is like, or as in like an or like as a paddle to row your boat and also or as in like that word of like you can do this or like Whoa. That like yeah that like cool. limit because like or is a word that like brings up limitless possibilities and then all or is also how you move yourself down that river aka life cool. and you do it gently because like the angels took themselves lightly so they were able to fly you have to take your own life lightly and not put too much stock into it wow. and, yeah and then it's merrily 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 life is but a dream which is true because like life is what we make of it and it's like our perceptions and like our subconscious like kind of dictate how we will live our lives and then that goes into the idea of like heaven and hell which are like terrestrial concepts of like heaven being just leading a happy life and hell like having like not being happy it's like or leading a life that isn't going anywhere and like people miss how terrestrial all of the teachings from spirituality truly are i feel like absolutely and jackson beautifully said dude that was all that was awesome um you'd probably like uh don miguel ruiz he wrote the four agreements uh, oh yeah no i'm i'm gonna read that one next and dude that one's that one's good because he talks about um 
he was from Toltec culture. Yeah. So ancient Native American Toltec culture, his lineage. But he talks about when you describe hell, mm. he says uh, one of his agreements is be impeccable with your word. And he breaks down the etymology of impeccable. Mm. He says impeccable means without sin. Mm. But he says not sin in like a moralistic religiosity way. Yeah, the word sin originally means like missing your mark. Like, yes, anything that goes against yourself mm -hmm. and not being in alignment with yourself. Mm -hmm. And then he talks a lot about how words are um, the power of words to influence and uh, hypnotize the psyche. Mm -hmm. And so he says words are spells. Yeah, they are. So we cast spells when we use words. We're either manifesting mm -hmm. or we can poison. Mm -hmm. We talk negatively about others. And like, and like, that's why I like the idea of like, I've come to like view it as like dark magicians and light magicians. Yeah. Cause they're still doing like, there are these two people who are doing great acts of magic. And like an example of like a dark magician would be like Eddie Bern Edward Bernays, like who started psycho who started psycho at who started the psychoanalytical field in America. Um, okay. Yeah. He was the nephew of Freud. Um, uh -huh. And so he brought that to America, and then, uh, yeah, it's 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 pretty. Dude, well. you're going you're going in, man. I'm in deep in, and it's cool because I'm appreciating having like a holistic view of it all. Because like, it's I'm looking at it both like historically, scientifically, and like spiritually. So like being able to like look at it through like those like practices is giving me it's a lot of insight. That's awesome. That's awesome. I love it. You know, it's cool because like. I know I was raised Christian. Oh, we're so off topic. I haven't even asked you any questions. <laughs> You're good, man. You yeah. know, we could, we could end up talking about everything, but I want to make sure you get to everything you need. And then Jackson, I'd love if you will send me a copy of this when you're done. Okay. I'd love to love take, it. yeah, dude. And I can share some of it, some clips on our Instagram and put it up on our YouTube because I think it's going to be awesome. Yeah, no, yeah, hell yeah, because I'm also asking you questions about your profession, about like how you got to where you are, and I know you love talking about that. Yeah, because I I know, and I like deeply hope that you know that you, the work you do is is that like God is like that Christ work, and it is like you're spreading the knowledge of like that Christ energy and stuff, and that's it's beautiful, and I very much appreciate that I was able to be a part of the process because now. Look at me now. <laughs> yeah, dude. And yeah. I I appreciate you saying that because there's been times throughout where um, I haven't known what direction to go. And I really have looked to my faith and to God and the divine and however you want to define that for guidance, mm -hmm. and support. Mm -hmm. And yeah, one of the things that I've always aligned with, man, like mm -hmm. has been that Christ consciousness, just mm -hmm. the, the conceptual framework of love and light energy for anybody going through any walk of life and any pain and giving them respite and care and compassion. And I feel like I've gotten that mm -hmm. from my faith and from my relationship with Christ, man. And so it's like, man, to be able to come anywhere close to forming a space that can offer that type of uh respite and care feels awesome but dude oftentimes it doesn't feel like me mm -hmm. i mean it feels like i'm on this mission yeah and, and something's working through me like yeah and that's the idea of like that greater collective it's like that's what that's what, like that idea of like creativity is the self like being able like to that creative energy of the self but then when you do collaboration and like work with the community that's that idea of like Christ consciousness and coming together to work for something greater than the self. Absolutely. Yeah, no. Um, okay. Let's hop into some of these questions uh, yeah. first off. Um, and then we can get back to all the cool esoteric stuff. Right? <laughs> awesome. Um, no. Okay. So uh, first off, uh, would you mind stating your name and your uh, current titles and roles uh, in uh, where you work? Awesome. Yes, my name is Dr. Wes Robbins, and I am the president and founder of Eternal Strength Center for Radical Youth Work. Mm -hmm. I am also a licensed professional counselor mm -hmm. in private practice, 
And I am also the founder of Cosmic Lamb, a nonprofit 501c3 that provides families with therapeutic support services that can't afford them. Wow. Very, very, very cool. Um, it's a pleasure to being able to talk to you, Dr. Wes. Thank God, you. that's so crazy. You're a doc. Oh, I'm so proud of you. Uh, <laughs> that PhD kicked my butt, man, but it was Jackson, the most beautiful growth oriented thing that I've ever done. I really, that program in particular mm -hmm. was amazing in terms of the professors, mm -hmm. my fellow colleagues and the individuals in my cohort and other cohorts. It was just an awesome and eclectic program. Awesome. Yeah. And this actually uh, perfectly leads us into uh, the next couple of questions that I have for you. Uh, so first off, where did you get your master's degree? And then where did you get your PhD? Yes. So I'm going to, I'm going to back up even before that. And I'll, because it makes sense of where I, where and why I did my master's where I did. So I did my bachelor's in psychology, in psychology at Georgia state university and Jackson, I went through a really rough period, 17 to 23. Mm -hmm. Addiction, substance use, three arrests, emotional turmoil, fallout with my family. So my undergrad psychology degree was pretty scattered with my cumulative GPA. Mm. Several semesters, I was just not well, not yeah. focused on school and academics at all, and it reflected. And mm. so I ended up graduating with my bachelor's with a 2.3 cumulative GPA. And I started to, I was working in a CD shop, making eight bucks an hour. And I started to look at master's programs and I was either going to go to law school or go get my master's in counseling. I wanted to go do my master's again at Georgia state in their psychology program through the college of education. They have a pretty good master's in psychology and counseling and, but they needed a 2.5 cumulative GPA. So the only way I could do that it's was right. yes, to go back for a year and take post baccalaureate classes so I started to look into that. And then while I was doing that research, I found a place called Argosy University, which has since closed. It's no longer around, but it was a private university and it had a lot of adjunct professors from Emory, Mercer, UGA, Georgia State. So I went to that orientation and it was a master's in community counseling at Argosy University that was K CREP accredited, which is the accreditation to become a licensed professional counselor. So I did my master's at Argosy and it was a it was really unique, man. I did it in the evenings, Monday and Wednesday from like six to ten, and really had a good group of professors. Dr. William Dover Spike, who's renowned in ethics and um law in terms of counseling, Dr. Jody Iodice, who became a mentor and a colleague, and she's amazing. So I had a I had a really good experience. Yeah, no, that is that is very awesome. Yeah, no, and it uh especially because hearing like right now in my careers in psychology class, we're like looking at what we are gonna want to be doing by the time we get to our masters and even when we get to our PhD and stuff. Um and like we have had to look at like some uh uh counseling pro or like just depending on what field you want to do like rather than like io or whatever um right, right. yeah I, i've been looking at some counseling programs um and I, ha I haven't really heard anything much about like the community counseling so is that like more like kind of like that idea of like being oriented with like like the christ consciousness of like being able to like lift a community up you know what's interesting jackson is at the time I really wasn't paying much attention to that. So I, I can remember vividly, Allison, my wife, she wasn't my wife at the time, but we were dating. She came to that orientation with me and we sat in a room and they broke down um, all the different courses that you take in the master's in community counseling. And really I was just kind of searching for, I've, I've always looked for something that felt like it touched my soul and my heart. So I operate a lot on affect, like just emotional resonance. And they gave us a book. They said, here's a book by um, Jonathan Kotler, K-O-T-T-L-E-R, called On Being a Therapist. And they said, here's our recommendation. Go read this book. Do the orientation tonight. Go home, read this book. And if you resonate with it, this is the program for you. I went and I read that book in a couple of days. And I was like, man, I was fascinated. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so I came back and I chose to go there, but I, the community counseling program, it did have a little bit more coursework that was looking at social work, community-based programs. But at the time that wasn't necessarily the reason that I went into it. The reason I really went into it is they accepted me. (laughs) My GPA met the requirements. It fit my schedule because I was needing to still work at the time yeah. um, to pay rent and to cover expenses. And I love that book. And I liked a couple of the professors that I talked to. So I just I just basically bit the bullet, went for it. But the whole time, Jackson, I mm-hmm. was questioning, do I even want to do this? I was still at a point in my life. I was like 24, 25, 26. And I was like, man. Do I even want to be a therapist? Am I going to be successful at this? Um, Do I even believe in therapy? I really didn't know. I just knew that I was going to finish my master's and that became the goal. And Mm -hmm. so, um, but like I said, these really unique professors and it, it was stuff that I was interested in Jackson. So all of a sudden I went from struggling with my bachelor's in psychology, having a 2.3 oh. graduated to getting a 3.98 in the master's program and being fascinated with every paper, every assignment, every quiz, every test, every lecture I was in and I, and it was starting to click for me. So it was like my examination of human behavior and psychology. I was hungry like you are more information i was like this is great i get to take abnormal i get to take theory i get to take it was like it was stuff that i really wanted to study yeah no and i I think that is like very fascinating and at all because like for me and also i just like how the way that things end up lining up for ourselves because even you going into that master's program that you didn't have like the idea or i don't know if you had the idea yet of like even starting like something like eternal strength or like starting like a community center uh but like just it played out in such a way of where you got the knowledge that you needed at the time. And now you're here with that knowledge and like using it and expanding with it as much as you can, which I think is admirable. Awesome. Yeah, no. um, But where did you get your, uh, or your uh, doctorate degree? So that was a journey. And I know I end up adding more to some of these questions, but for me, it's the connection. Mm -hmm. So I, And I think it's important for me to mention, like, Jackson, I had this in my lineage. So my mom has her master's in behavioral analysis from Drake University, a pretty prominent university in Iowa. And then my grandmother, say it again. That's where my dad's from. Okay. I was was born in Des Moines. My dad was born in Des Moines. Was everybody from Iowa just born in Des Moines? I think so, dude. (laughs) I don't remember it. I only lived there when I was like one um you know but, but I was, like several people who are like have family or in iowa and they were all from des moines okay and, i think and and the odd thing i always think about is i think slipknot is from des moines iowa too that hmm. yeah. yeah yeah that's crazy um, um hmm. but my mom had her master's from there in behavioral analysis she runs an advocacy center that works with abused and neglected kids it's called safe path in Cobb county georgia and then her mom my nana who's still alive. She's 93. She's amazing. She has her EDD in psychology, her educational doctorate from Vanderbilt University. And she was the assistant dean at Charleston Southern University for about a decade. So like, dude, and even I can go even back on my mom's side all the way to Naples, Italy. Mm -hmm. And, And my great, great grandmother and great, great grandfather and their six sons and one daughter were all either traveling musicians or some type of organic social worker, community-based stuff. So, dude, I think all this, when we talk about Jung and the unconscious and the subconscious, like, I think this was being instilled in me in ways that I didn't even recognize. Aware of, yeah. yeah, man. And so I did that master's, had a really good experience. Um, and then it's important for me to mention I was still working in music stores until they kind of fizzled out with technology and growth and iTunes. Mm -hmm. So then I did my internship, my practicum for the master's program at Peachford hospital. And yep. In their IOP program, intensive outpatient called next step. I did that for about a year. 
And then I got my master's and then I worked for an organization called Vive Family Support Program. And this was for young people coming out of wilderness programs, therapeutic boarding schools, residential treatment centers, coming back home. I did that, Jackson, for almost six years where before I even thought about going to get my PhD, I was working in the field a lot. I had my master's. I earned my full licensure. I was a therapeutic mentor, then a parent coach, then the clinical team for Atlanta. I built the Atlanta team. Love that work. And then in 2014 um, is when I started the PhD program. So I had just gotten my full licensure as a professional counselor. And I started to look at PhD programs all across the country. PhDs in counseling psychology and in clinical psychology. I applied to like eight different ones. I got accepted into two or three of them. Um, I went, I interviewed, and I really had this um, overwhelming uh, moment of disillusionment where I was like, man, I, my heart's not being called by any of these PhD programs. There's some cool research, but I don't think I want to do this. So I came back from one of the programs. It was in Greeley, Colorado. And I said to my wife, man, I don't even think I'm going to do my PhD in psychology. Maybe I'll go do a PhD in philosophy. And because I was really, I was still interested in human existence, existentialism, human behavior. Um, because all of those practices are deeply rooted within each other. Like looking at yes. like psychology, philosophy, psychology, all of them stem from one another. Absolutely. And, and philosophy being, you know, anthropology and philosophy being some of the earliest, but my wife was like, you're crazy. What are you doing? What about that one program at the university of West Georgia? So I was, and this is important to mention, I was in a supervision group and this is a group that you have to do to earn your hours for your full licensure. And it was with this guy, Phil Foster, who had his master's in divinity and he was a licensed professional counselor, and he was very Jungian and archetypal, psycho-spiritual work. And then another guy, David McLeod, that was um, awesome, cognitive behavioral therapy, solution-focused um, primarily. But they ran this supervision group. Phil Foster is the first one that mentioned University of West Georgia's PhD to me. Now, Jackson, I was working. I had done my first year of supervision with a clinical neuropsychologist in Roswell by the name of Dr. Damon Logsdon. Mm -hmm. He was amazing. Now, he was a licensed clinical neuropsychologist. And so I started to talk to him about PhD programs. And he said, Wes, no matter what, if you go do a PhD, just make sure that it is a APA, American Psychological Association accredited program so that you can become a licensed clinical psychologist. When Phil told me about University of West Georgia's PhD. And you found out they're not APA accredited. Yeah, they're not APA accredited because, dude, they're really rogue, man. It's very different. It is a PhD in consciousness and society. So it's a psychology doctoral degree, but it focuses on consciousness and society and it had three different arenas, humanistic psychologies, critical psychologies, and transpersonal psychologies. Oh, Dude, fun. oh it was awesome looking, but my, the whole time I was going, damn, it's, it's not, not APA accredited. Right. So then Jackson, I had to do this really big soul search of like, well, wait a minute. What can a licensed clinical psychologist do that a licensed professional counselor can't because I was already an LPC. And so I had to say, okay, man, what is the difference here? Now a licensed clinical psychologist can administer a lot of different assessments. Mm. So the MMPI, um, different, different measurements and assessments and psycho psychological evaluations. It's very so psychoanalytic. Right. Well, more um, diagnoses, M more looking at using the DSM and administering um, large psychological evaluations to determine if somebody may be struggling with particular diagnoses. Now, Damon, Dr. Logston was doing a lot of work with forensic psychology and um, 
different evaluations looking at fine motor and gross motor functioning, memory, recall, neuropsychology. Long story short, Jackson, I came back and I was like, man, I'm not really interested in doing a tremendous heavy amount of evaluations and assessments. I want to be able to do unique creative therapy as a licensed professional counselor. And then I really want the PhD to forward my own growth and understanding academically. And then at some point, I love the ability to be able to teach at university and to be able to write and research and contribute to the field of psychology with journal articles and publications. So when I started to look at all the details, I was like, man, I think I'm going to go with the program that feels the best. So in 2014 is when I started the PhD program at the University of West Georgia. Wow. Okay. Yeah, definitely a school to be looking out for. Uh, <laughs> no, that program sounds amazing. Cause like, yeah, no, for me, at least like with like my journey, like right now and like careers in psychology and like looking at different schools and stuff and just like with my own like personal like beliefs and stuff, I feel like going like I want to get my PhD for the same reason. And like, I want to go to school. I want to get my master's for the same reason that you wanted to get your PhD, not because I can become some accredited uh, like person who will like have high stature in the, in like uh, the field, but I want to be able to have the knowledge and understanding of a person at that level, but not confined to the constraints that are put on psychologists at that level. Cause at that level you have to like, zone in on one small little thing and you kind of lose that holistic view of it all which yeah. feels and part and of I, would, I would add jackson i've met a lot of people who the more credentials you can get the more doors it can open none of it's a guarantee because i've met a lot of people with a lot of degrees a lot of credentials a lot of licensure who don't end up doing much with it and then i've met people with not as much who do, do a lot, lot. So I, I think it, but I think it comes down to the individual and you looking at what's important for you and what goals you're trying to reach. Um, I will tell you, I'm very glad that the master's program that I did was KCREP, C-A-C-R-E-P accredited, which means it puts you in position to be a licensed professional counselor. That was really helpful because having that licensure probably let me be at the place with the PhD where I wasn't as concerned. Because again, remember my question was like, man, what, what would the licensure as a clinical psychologist give me that- That you don't already have as- right. And I was already doing what I wanted, dude. I was in a full private practice. It was thriving. Yeah, that was place- doing, say, say it again. That place dope. Yeah, yeah. All those offices I had. So, so I had to weigh it. But I think as you go on that journey- the more you can learn and the more you can evaluate programs and meet with people, talk to people who have been in the program, professors. That was the other cool thing I did with the PhD at the University of West Georgia is I met this guy, Nick Atlas, Dr. Nick Atlas, who's done some profound work with um, Yoga Nidra and psycho-spiritual work. He's really cool, man. He wrote a beautiful book called The Light Workers. You, you'd like him. I think I, um, yeah, he's, but- uh -huh. Sorry. Somebody, yeah. Sorry to cut you off. Uh, it's telling me that I have a time limit on how long I can record. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> what's it say? It says eight minutes left. No, dude. What I can do is I can send you a Zoom link if you oh, want. Do you have like the unlimited like. Or let me see if I can just record. Oh, yeah. I'm sending a request to you right now to let me record. Okay, cool. So you, I, I'll have the first half. You'll have the back half. That's perfect. Yeah. Um. Let me see. Recording. No, don't do all that. Hold on. Bear with me. It wants me to. Um... Which one you to do? It's saying, um, yeah, I see the time left now, but when I'm going recording, it's saying it wants me to upgrade. Yeah, it also wants me to upgrade. So I think let's just get out as much as we can and possibly just restart the session and then record again. Okay, cool, cool, cool. 
So uh, I'm totally, totally cool with that. Let me see. Yeah, because it's making me sign in. Hold on. Let me see if I can do this. Sign in. Yeah, because can't you just turn around and send me another link and then we chop it up and we have two? Yeah, I think so. Okay. All right, so um, my next question for you is, what sacrifices, if any, did you have to make in getting your degree? Um, yeah, and then I have the follow-up for that is, what sacrifices, if any, did you have to make in establishing your private practice? Okay. okay. So um, like starting off with the degree and then to the practice. Yeah, the sacrifices with the degree were really time and energy and effort. So at the time, again, I was making eight bucks an hour. I was working in a CD shop. I liked my job, but it was a leap of faith where I was like, okay, I'm going to go get this master's and I'm going to work on it every free second I have. So really, but Jackson, it was at a point in my growth and development where I was like 25, 26. I was really tired of, um, I'd been through a lot with with drug use and substance abuse that I was done with that and then in terms of social stuff man like people would call me and be like Wes you got to come out we're going out this weekend we're going to this concert or we're going to see this and I'd be like look man I can't I got to work on this paper I got to do this thing so I would say it was it was sacrifice but it felt really good at that point in my development it felt like that's where I needed to be maturity wise and I was like, man, I like that I'm working on my career. I like I'm in a master's program. I like that I'm 26 years old and my friends are calling me and I'm like, actually, guys, I can't come hang out tonight. I'm focused on this. It felt like me starting to put me first over social, which I'd always done. To do and over like, yeah. So you, yeah, you really started becoming thyself or knowing yes. that. Yep. And, and that felt good. And I got more comfortable um, being alone and making more mature decisions. So I, I literally, I, I close up the music shop. I come home and I'd read and I'd write and I'd study instead of just like mindlessly watching TV or not being focused on anything. I'd start to bring in a lot of my assignments into the music store. And I had a really cool owner of the music store. And he said, whenever there's not customers and you finish all your work, you can work on school. So dude, I just start knocking out papers while I was up there and writing. So those were sacrifices that I made that felt really good, but I also didn't know what the payoff was going to be. So the whole time I was like, man, is this going to work? Mm. Is, you know, do I want to do this as a career? With but just trusting yourself in that and like trusting your like love for what you were doing really. Yes. Did. Yeah. And it just felt like forward movement. So even if I didn't know the outcome of it, I knew I was putting effort and energy towards forward movement and growth. I knew, and that's where I had to get out of my head and go, stop thinking about what it's going to look like specifically and just finish the master's degree. Yeah, no, because yeah, it's that kind of like that idea of like living in the present and like being able to be present with yourself in your work and your time. Absolutely. Yep. Much easier said than much easier said than done for her everyone it is yeah i know but i i feel like uh i'm really lucky for the space that i've been offered and everything because i feel like i'm only 18 and i'm starting to get into like all of this stuff and i don't know i feel like it's not an advantage but i feel grateful that i'm was put in a situation to where i can start this stuff and like and start it, myself this early it's like you said, though, too, you're there's probably a part of you that was aligning with it and moving towards it, whether you knew it or not. And so, like, I appreciate the gratitude and you saying that, but like, man, you're hungry for it. And I think even if I wouldn't have been around, the center wouldn't have been around, come hell or high water, you would have found your way to philosophy, psychology, human existence. But it's like this additional depth and holistic understanding because of what you yourself have been through on your own journey. Yeah, no, awesome. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, yeah, I love talking to you, Wes. It's always so fun. Uh, <laughs> all right, next question. Uh, what are some jobs that you would recommend to start off after finishing a master's program uh, to, give your, uh, to give yourself better leverage in the field of psychology? That's a great, um, so, Initially, 
mm-hmm. my thought process when I was in that position myself was, man, I just want the coolest job. Mm-hmm. I want, you know what I mean? Like I want to work at the coolest place with the coolest people. And I want it to all be easy going. Yeah. Um, now I can reflect back Jackson. And I'm so grateful that my internship was at Peachford hospital, a large psychiatric hospitalization facility that was very difficult to work at, had a lot of governmental red tape, had a lot of burnt out clinicians, had a lot of, uh, very challenging things to see in terms of over pathologization of clients over, uh, you know, um, prescribing, psychiatric and psychotropic medication but I'm so, the same kid every like three times a day yeah and but dude i'm so grateful that mm. i had that time in that environment because it made me that much more astute and aware of the field of psychology as a whole so my thing would be work at any place where you can learn and grow Instead of looking for the easiest job or the best fitting job, look at a place where you can learn and grow and understand the field as a whole. That was very helpful. You know, because I, I, I was talking to Kara about this yesterday, too, and she was telling me about how her first job, she was at some hospital, I forget what it was exactly, but like her first patient was a 40 year old man who killed three, like three babies and had no recollection of it. And like that was her first like person right after right right out of her master's degree yeah like yeah really I I know it seems like getting thrown into the field is something that's very helpful yes and not not that you got to stay in it forever but learning about it being understanding of it yeah well because it's kind of like that concept of like working with your shadow self and stuff of like being able to 